welcome to another video with Ryan. If you're noticing, this video came on at 9 o'clock instead of the normal 7.45, and that's because I participated with World Hoppers in a Secret Santa book thing, which is where we all read someone's favorite or highly rated book, and when we're going to do a review, and we're all dropping those at 9 a.m. If I'm given a playlist, I'll link that in the description so you can find everybody, but I'm really excited to see who got me. I have no idea what they picked. But we got Q and TG, who have an amazing channel with great production. They rap for Mistborn and like, they're awesome. And in a wrap up this year that I will also have linked down below, they said that they both gave five stars to Misery by Stephen King. And since Q and TG always do reviews with a partner, I thought I'd make Ryan read this with me because it's not that long. And I gave you like a month. So I felt like that was fine. Before this, I'd only read two other Stephen King's Instamnia and Gunslinger, and you've read none, right? Do I talk now? Yes! Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, I had only read some of his short stories. Uh, I'd seen a few of movies that have been, you know, based off his books, um, but only, I think only Pet Cemetery and one other horror one. I've seen, like, Stand By Me and Shawshank Redemption, which are both based off short stories, so I'm not very familiar with the novels of Stephen King, only uh, that he has some great short story collections, uh, some great adaptations. Um, the Shining, that's the other yeah. movie I was thinking about. Well, and also which like, he does not like. <laughs> well, he's written so many things. He's bound to like have hits. And neither of us are really like horror people. No, not really, no. So reading a thriller by King seemed like a good entry point. <laughs> right. So like I do in all my review videos, I just wanted to give our general thoughts. We'll each say what we thought of it without talking about the synopsis or spoilers, but this video will have like a spoiler free discussion section and then we'll maybe delve into the spoilers at the end, but I'll have a big spoiler tag. It'll be marked. You won't, you'll be able to get out of here before that happens if that's a concern for you. So Ryan, quick general thoughts slash rating, however you want to sell the book. Uh, this book was written during Stephen King's drug uh, riddled years and that is a big part of why this book got written. Another big part of why this book got written is because uh, previous to Misery, the book that uh, had come out uh, was called The Eyes of the Dragon. Yeah, it was a middle grade fantasy. Yeah, yeah it was like a kind of like a children's fantasy novel. And at this point, he was already very established as a horror writer, as like the horror writer. So uh, fan backlash to this, this fa children's fantasy novel was pretty harsh. So... Um, he wrote Misery, which is about, you know, uh, uh... We're not supposed to get to the synopsis yet, but Well, okay. no, but the, that, that, oh, fine, fine. <laughs> I'll stop there because that kind of plays into my thoughts about this because I knew that going into reading this book. And I knew about the movie. I knew generally what the idea was going to be about. I only, but then I realized, like, my, my knowledge of the book kind of stopped about 50 pages in. Yeah. Um, and so... Uh, my general thoughts is that it, it was, it was a fun book. I, I do think it was a, uh, I'm not a fast reader and I read this very quickly. Oh yeah. For you, you sped through yeah, this. Yeah. I was reading like 20, 30 pages a night. And usually I'm lucky if I get to like 15 pages before I go to bed. So yeah, it was, it was very easy to get through. And I think, am I supposed to talk about like whether or not I recommend it now or is that? We can talk. I mean, we can talk about that later, I guess. Okay. God, I don't know where you want me to stop. I I'm not, I'm not, this is not how I set up my reviews. That's fair. I, maybe I should have gone first, but basically for me, this was like a solid three out of five stars, probably mid to high three. Like Ryan was saying, it is relatively enjoyable. It's not a bad book. It's definitely outside of my comfort zone. Not only that it's a thriller, but that Stephen King has a writing style that is, I would say, dense and like very intentional. Like he there are reasons behind what he does so I appreciate the intention but it doesn't always work for me in storytelling so we'll we'll talk about what worked and didn't work for me but that's like where I am coming from without giving away anything that happens in the novel but I mean I would if you're at come to the end of the review and you're like the things that bothered you didn't bo won't bother me yeah pick it up like go ahead yeah I think uh, as as my first Stephen King book I think this was kind of a, a decent first entry um in, in that regard. It's not really a horror book. It's it's suspenseful, but it's not like, um, I don't know, it doesn't, it doesn't really scare you. Yeah. And so the synopsis, so now we're going to talk about it, is we have Paul who writes kind of trashy popular fiction, and he hates that. 
and so he tries to write like higher fiction and one day though because he's dumb he gets into an accident and is saved by Annie <laughs> and Annie is his biggest fan and coerces him into bringing back a character from the dead that he killed in his popular fiction series and um it's a hostage situation that escalates very quickly <laughs> is what I would say for the general synopsis so let's talk about first the things that we did like about it and I'll go first this time I liked the themes I really did like looking at it from the lens of this is an author who is obviously like Stephen King is talking about how frustrating it is to be an author who is popular with a fan base that only wants x from them it makes it hard for them to be an artist it's very frustrating and like at first I was actually put off by the writing style because I'm like this is like kind of pretentious yeah, it's a bit self-indulgent but then I was like but Paul is a self-indulgent character he's that writer who thinks he's better than he is and like is being real artistic and deep and it's honestly how he's surviving <laughs> so like then I turned around in the writing style where I'm like it's intentional it's fine and like I don't know you can talk more maybe about the themes of drugs and stuff but like I thought that was also pretty prevalent in this story yeah and uh, I think I, I the stuff I like really just kind of piggybacks onto everything you said I really liked um how so this this is kind of a th this comparison came into my head when I was trying to put my thoughts together and it's a little out there but just keep <laughs> keep with me on this one we're going up for a ride um you know the movie Tropic Thunder I know out. of it, but I've not watched it. So Tropic Thunder is this movie that came out in 2008. Uh, ben Stiller, Jack Black, Robert Downey Jr. Um, and it's a it's a movie about making a movie and it's a comedy and it parodies like actors, um, you know, doing uh, doing roles that aren't meant for them or actors trying to break out of roles. And basically it makes fun of Hollywood productions. And I, I bring that up because I remember uh, Ben Stiller saying you know, when I do, he did another movie, uh, Zoolander, where he was parodying models. I did watch that one. Yeah. So <laughs> he said, in comparison to other movies where I'm, you know, lampooning other industries, I'm part of the movie industry. So we were a little bit meaner this time around. <laughs> um, and that, that kind of popped into my head when I was thinking about how Stephen King uses his character, who is an author, to kind of rant and ramble but also like indulge um about just his perspective on things both like from fan backlash but also you could tell like there are moments in the book where you can really tell he's having fun with it yeah. like you it's from this uh, author paul's pov and like his imagination just runs wild and you know you see paul's writing process in the book which I don't know if it's actually Stephen King's writing process, but it, it's it's kind of fun in that regard. Oh, you're totally right. I think, so the author, when he has to write this book, he's talking about how the hole opens in the page. Right. And you can like see through it and that's like how he sees the scene he's writing and like, I can't write and I'm not a visual reader. So, but that was very descriptive for me. And I was like, oh, that's a cool way of describing like your writer's block versus your inspiration. And I mean, that's when the book was its best for me. This book has three to four parts and the second Part was my favorite when he was really writing the novel and also I liked that we have the secondary novel in the book like we get to read some of this kind of popularized fiction and I was a little invested in it because <laughs> it it was like you know memory police that we have reviewed and read where it had parallels yeah, to what the was story happening within a story yeah <laughs> yeah this this takes a very literal sense of the story within a story mechanic um, because <laughs> as Angela mentioned before uh, Annie is Paul's number one fan <laughs> And uh, Paul just recently put out uh, the latest in his Misery series. He has a character named Misery um, in in this in this in these pulp books that he puts out. Um, and Annie didn't like the ending of the last book, so she makes him write uh, a new a new book. Um, so that basically that's where Stephen King kind of really gets to get kind of meta. With yeah, his, uh, it with was, his character. And this is the start where we start to get into things I don't like. I think sometimes he's a little too meta. And I hate to say that about a book where he's literally like, let me do what I want. Yeah. <laughs> like, I get it. But there were just like, like one of my least favorite things for most of the book, and I still don't think it should be there, is like the first page of the book is Goddess Africa, which like kind of makes sense now that I've read the book, but I still don't know why this is a page here. That felt too deep. Like, I think the book 
tries to get a little weird <laughs> at times. And like... I didn't think anything of it when I first like saw that. I was like, all right, well, this is going to mean something later. I don't know. but If also, it doesn't, whatever, he, it's art. And also, like, I mean, this came out in the late 80s, but like... I don't know if he acts, he did it in like a weird playing off of what everyone does when they write about Africa as white people or if like he just didn't realize what he was doing because it was the 80s and we hadn't had discourse about it. Yeah. But like he could have picked a country. It didn't have to be the whole continent. <laughs> yeah, there, there's definitely uh, points in this book where it was written in 1987 by a white guy. Yeah, I mean, there was straight up a scene where he's comparing an action to rape. And I'm like, I mean, you're being violated, but it's actually not like... Those are not the same. Yeah, that, that word got thrown a lot, around a lot very casually. Yeah, so I mean... but as, like, as someone who grew up in New England, I can relate to him on that level. Yeah, you were not upset, but you were talking about like... Okay, so here's things I didn't like. You know, Angela has incredibly valid ones. And here's my, my rant as a Massachusetts native. So in the beginning of the book, Paul's talking about his fond memories of being on Revere Beach. Now, Revere Beach is nothing to be a fond memory of. And he even mentions that it's trash. But don't, don't use Revere Beach as a point of happiness. <laughs> yeah, so that was something that like comes up in like the first two pages. So like, don't worry about it. But yeah, is there anything else that you thought was like a slight negative that you'd want people to know? Uh, the yeah the his his nonchalant language usage was was one thing that is kind of and that's that's not just him I think I've I've done it on uh when I did Stranger in a Strange Land like I think I just noticed that with the, these these older uh, white male authors from you know decades before they kind of you know that's just kind of how people talked and yeah. didn't really there were just pay any mind to there it. were just definitely moments where like there were words he used that are slurs that you he, they weren't needed to be used like I don't mind when they're used when it makes sense but he was literally just referencing a work he wrote and just like used a slur for a Hispanic person and I'm just like yeah this didn't I mean we 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 could just have said who it was we, we get it someone in Harlem who's Spanish like we could have just said that <laughs> and sometimes it just felt like I mean, some things were definitely done for shock appeal and were done well. And we'll talk about that, I mean, a little in the spoiler section. But other things, I was just like, you're just using language because you can and it's not cool. Like, yeah. <laughs> but I think the last question we should answer in the spoiler free section is how do you think it worked as a thriller? Knowing that we don't read thrillers often, but. Yeah, as, as um, I mean, I, I, I've read mystery books before, um, but I, I do think it, he did a very good job of like, maintaining suspense and it, it it's such a like it's such a small setting like it, it takes place pretty much entirely in Andy's house um it's he does a very good job of maintaining small moments of suspense um so I think it's just it's one of those books that does it's not one of those like constant thrill rides yeah um so and during those quieter moments is when um the imaginative side uh kind of gets to run wild and you're just in his head but when something's actually happening like uh he's in a wheelchair because his legs are damaged and so like whenever he tries to like be rebellious um i think those moments are pretty fun yeah, I think you're right. Um, it's a weird thing where I think I picked this up because I mean, I, I just read Rhythm of War, which is like 1200 pages. I read that in about the same time that I read Misery because I expected this. I, I have this expectation that might be wrong, but I feel like thrillers are supposed to be these books that you pick up and it comes a point where it grabs you and you can't put it down. Yeah, That's my expectation. And although this is tense and suspenseful and thrilling at times, I don't think it's that type of thriller. I yeah, think it's, it's actually kind of good to read it in like bite-sized chunks. Yeah, it's more like a slow burn thriller. So I think it's a good thriller. But if you pick it up, just know its pacing is not that. It grabs you and then you can't put it down. At least I don't think it was that way for either of us. No. So, I mean, you still, I mean, it was definitely faster paced than anything you've read this year for you. Yeah. But um, for me, it definitely wasn't the fastest paced thing. I don't think that was a bad thing. But I think I was surprised by that in the first part when it was so introspective for so long. Because yeah. it takes some time before we get into those tense moments where he's trying to be rebellious. Yeah. So, but that's our spoiler-free section. 
I mean, if, if, if this sounds like a story you would like and you like the context of it, I'd pick it up. There are lots of people who love it. And yeah. if you like hearing the meta thoughts of an author, I think this is probably pretty great to pick apart. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think if you enjoy meta commentary on writing, um, this is a, I think this is like right up your alley. If you like stories that, that are kind of like small in scale, um, if there's something like, if you're looking for a thriller, but nothing that's going to get like your heart pounding. Yeah. If you're just trying to like dip your toe into the genre, it's that. Um, yeah. I would not recommend it if you are a little squeamish about... Body horror Yeah, stuff. body horror. Because um, yeah. there, it's not throughout the book, but there are some moments that that'll make you wince. Yeah, and I'll, I'll have a link down below to a Storygraph review, and Storygraph's a really great um, platform, and you can click on content warnings if you want to know. But now we're going to switch into spoiler section, so there's going to be a nice spoiler banner here. So, did, did we like the ending, Ryan? What did you think of the ending? I liked it. You liked it? Yeah, you didn't, right? I, I mean, I don't know if I didn't or did. So, like, with the ending, there's like a false ending, almost, yep. where... Things happen and maybe Annie's dead, maybe she's not. We don't actually know yet as the reader, but in this, like, imagined scene, Annie's alive and is in his apartment and kills him. Yeah. Which, like, I think would have been an awesome ending, <laughs> but instead it's more realistic, which I think's better, but, like, I low-key, with how resourcefully, bizarrely crazy Annie was, I kind of wanted that to happen. Well, th and that's another, like... <laughs> meta commentary level that he puts into the book that I really enjoyed was that Annie so uh, the the focus of this book is is Paul basically writing this new misery novel to so that Annie won't kill him yep <laughs> um so his whole thing is that uh he originally in in Misery's Return is the book that just comes out before he gets into this accident and in Misery's Return... No, he... it's Misery's Child. He's writing Misery's Return. I'm sorry, you're right. Yeah. yeah. Misery's Return is the book he's writing for Annie. I'm... Because he kills oh. Misery in Misery's Child. Yeah. And he was so elated, and he wrote another book uh, completely separated from the Misery series and wanted to go on, on a celebratory trip to L.A. Um, I yeah. think to see his editor, but he decided to take a road trip. No, what happened? I don't like Paul. I think Paul is one of the most unlikable protagonists I've ever had to be sympathetic for. Because, <laughs> like, he does, like, lose limbs, so, like, I feel bad for him. His situation's not great. But he finishes the book and decides, just for fun, before he goes to L.A., he's in a hotel in Colorado, to get drunk and then go driving around the mountains because the storm's not going to show up till the next day. And then the storm shows up, he gets in a car accident, and then Annie finds him. Like, his, com his situation is completely his fault. Yeah. <laughs> and he's a completely unlikable, pretentious author type who's like, oh, this book's so good, I'm gonna get a Booker Award for it. Mwahaha. And he, like, he's very unlikable in part one, and it's not till, like, Annie actually, like, literally goes off her rocker that I start to feel sympathy for him. So, <laughs> yeah, so he's writing a sequel to Misery's Child, and he has to bring Annie back to, or he has to bring Misery back to oh, life. Oh, this was something I liked. <laughs> yeah. And Annie basically explains that Paul cheated to bring Misery back. And yeah. uh, he basically, like, it, it goes into this author's te technique, basically, can you, you know? Like, can you write yourself out of this situation? Um, can you revive this character without it feeling... Like, you cheated. Like, you just, you know, used an unexplained way to do it. Um, and that's that's what I really like about the ending, is that, you know, they break the fourth wall and say, that would be a, like, that's not how it happened, because it's not a can you situation. <laughs> I know, but I... So, I think, I think it was an appropriate ending, given all the setup that there was. Yeah, no, and I mean, it's not a bad ending in terms of, like, this, like... I mean, I think it's one of those things where, like, him making it felt weird to me. Like, I almost would have liked it better if both him and Annie died in a fire at the house. Because... I mean, you, yeah. I mean, because I just, I guess, I don't mind that it's tropey, but I just feel like whenever you're watching a horror movie or a thriller, you always know that there'll be one person, they'll probably be pretty beat up, but they're, they're gonna make it. <laughs> and I was kind of hoping he'd subvert that a little bit. 
considering how much subversion we were getting. Yeah. So, I mean, but it's not a big deal. Like, it's it's fine. Well, isn't that the whole thing about Stephen King is that he doesn't know how to, or he's not known for good endings? Yeah, and I don't know. I mean, of the other two I've read, one I read 12 years ago, so I'm not giving a review on that because it was so long ago. But Gunslinger, I don't think, was a quality book overall. I will... I think it's better when you know more about the series or if you're in the headspace for the weird journey that book is, mm -hmm. which I was not when I picked it up. But no, I mean, in general, I think I was more into the moments when we were learning about Annie. I think Annie was definitely the more interesting character of the story, even though she was kind of a character of her type of character. Yeah, there's... Like, I don't actually know mm -hmm. about how good the representation is of whatever mental illnesses are in her which are a few yeah i, I think <laughs> i think the um i don't think there was any attempt at, at realism i think it like, was yeah i think the reason why annie works as a villain is that it's fathomable like apparently annie is actually based on a real serial killer yeah, and he does, like, have a thing at the beginning where, like, he talks about the drug that's being used as well. Which, I, honestly, for me, the drug addiction was kind of the scarier part. Yeah. <laughs> well, because, I don't know, like, I mean, even at the end of the book, there's repercussions for that. And I know Stephen King's kind of working through his own addiction thoughts yeah. as he's writing Paul's thing. But, like, how he was tied to Annie in so many ways, including that drug that she was, like, giving him was, like, kind of scary to me. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, I think... The scariest part was the unpredictability of Annie's moods, right? Like, yeah. you, you never knew when Hurricane Annie was coming through. And and then, like, you you, you couldn't really fathom what she would do next because she would do crazy things that would seem out of character, but then I'd remember she's more than one character, essentially, and yeah. how she's written. Yeah, it's, it's a very layered book for, for what little there is to it. I mean, I, I am glad we read it together because I couldn't talk to the internet about it and, like, It'd be fun walking around the house and being like, what part are you at? And I'm like, Annie just chopped off his thumb. <laughs> like, casual things. Because he was ahead of me for most of it. So I could just talk to him about it until the very end. Because I, once I get 50 or 60 pages to the end of the book, I just have to, like, spend an hour and kill it. <laughs> sort of thing. But, I mean, I'm, I'm generally really glad that I did read it, that the Secret Santa happened. Like, it's not a five star for me. And, like... It's not a favorite of all time, but it was, like, a good reading experience. And, like, yeah. talking to you about it, it's, like, there was a lot of nuance here that I can appreciate. Like I said, I really like when authors have intention in their work, even when I don't love it. Yeah, I can I can absolutely see why this could be, like, somebody's favorite Stephen King book. Yeah. Um, it's, I mean, I, I still liked it. I just wasn't absolutely enthralled by it, but that's just... That's just personal preference, I think. Oh, yeah, no, I mean, I yeah, there's plenty of people, I think, who this would work really well for. I think for me, a lot of it is, like, his writing style has always been challenging for me. And then give me an unlikable protagonist and a really crazy antagonist. Like, it's just hard for me to find things to latch on to for longer than I expected. Yeah, I mean, if you're looking for any sort of, of, of character to... to... <laughs> insert yourself and go through the story with you're not you're not gonna find it here unless you really are like paul which no, like no shade but like he's, he's he's kind of yeah i wonder how other authors feel about this book i feel like that'd be a good yeah a good question well i do know someone in the discord was like that book's so great and i know he's currently writing hmm. but i mean the parts where paul is being an author aren't the parts that i dislike about paul's character <laughs> yeah like those aren't the moments where i'm like oh my god paul shut up like it's more like before he realizes how bad his situation is and he's still being arrogant. Right. Like, those are the moments where I'm like, oh, my God, stop thinking this way. This is like, no one thinks this way, Paul. Stop it. <laughs> like, but Paul does. <laughs> I have thoughts about Paul. Like I said, three to four stars, definitely higher three range. It yeah. was good. So Q and TG have a much more glowing... <laughs> Um, response in their wrap-up which like I said is linked down below and I guess if you didn't notice Ryan's wearing a Ron Swanson Christmas sweater I don't know what it says there's no wrong way to consume alcohol <laughs> and I'm wearing my Captain America Christmas sweater and I hope you liked this review um sorry if we hurt your feelings I think we were pretty generous with our critiques but you know. I'm not I'm not doing any more reviews with you why we have two different reviewing styles I'm sorry. We were all over the place. This was, That was a mess. <laughs> I 
I thought it was pretty good. But anyways, like if you liked it, subscribe if you want to, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye. You won't see me. <laughs>